After having been victim to the deception of Laban, which saw him not only tricked into marrying the sister of the woman he loved, but also saw him roped into 14 years worth of servitude, Jacob had certainly tasted his own medicine, and for the first time in his life, was on the receiving end of a treacherous scheme. Indeed, he was able to marry Rachel, the woman he truly loved, but now there was also Leah, a woman he had already expressed a lack of interest in. Along with this, the remaining years that he was in debt to Laban were still ahead of him, and whilst the Bible tells us that these flew by because of Jacob's love for Rachel, it was still several years of his life that he was never going to get back. Having two wives might have sounded like all fun and games, but when you consider how the Bible describes Leah in comparison to Rachel, telling us she has weak eyes, whereas Rachel had a lovely figure, it might be said that Jacob's attention to Leah was seen as a chore. After all, this was not the woman he loved, and this was not the deal he had originally agreed to. Additionally, it wasn't as if the union between these three characters was amicable, and we understand from the Bible that tensions between Leah and Rachel only increased, and the circumstances of their new relationship became a breeding ground for envy, jealousy, and bitterness. But God is seen to take sympathy upon Leah, and we are told that when the Lord saw that she was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but that Rachel remained childless. It goes to show us that Leah was unfairly judged by her appearance, and despite going on with Laban's deception, probably on the account that she was forced to, she was mostly innocent. God recognised this, and so, as a means to make up for such poor treatment, he enabled her to have children, something that was a great honour at the time, and certainly an honour for Leah, who would be carrying the child descended from the great Isaac and Abraham, to whom the covenant was granted. It might also be said that as the Bible tells us that Rachel remained childless, God was teaching Rachel a lesson, for there may have been a certain haughtiness or conceit expressed by Rachel towards her sister, given that she was the more physically beautiful one and the one that Jacob had chosen. The Bible continues to tell us, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Here we are introduced to Jacob's first son, Reuben, though the focus of the passage is mainly fixed on Leah, who confirms that she was miserable and that God must have felt her pain, hence why he rewarded her with a child. But almost touchingly, Leah still pines for Jacob, who we gather holds unrequited love for. He does not return her affections, and probably did not look at her in the same way he looked at Rachel. Yet she lives in hope that having delivered him a child, a son no less, he would start to love her. It's interesting to note though, that despite desiring Rachel more, Jacob still does sleep with Leah, suggesting that Jacob wasn't that turned off by her, or perhaps, more logically, that he was fulfilling his obligation as a husband, and didn't want Leah to tell her father that she was being neglected. If she did, then Jacob may have believed that Laban would punish him, given that in that instance, he would have had motive. With this, Jacob laying with Leah could be seen as more of a legal obligation, a courtesy, and ultimately, a chore. But God certainly does recognise Leah's continued pain, and we understand that despite producing Reuben for Jacob, he still does not love her any more than before. So God allowed Leah to carry another child, and the Bible tells us, She conceived again and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Leah continues to recognise that Jacob does not love her, and there is a feeling of acceptance in her words. She
she's not satisfied with the reality that her husband loves her sister more, but she seems to almost come to terms with it, or at least admit it openly, that it doesn't hurt her as much. There is no doubt that she still has feelings for Jacob, and as we see later on, she definitely still wants him to love her. But with the birth of her second child, Simeon becomes a great comfort to her, and perhaps even a justification of her pain. In other words, she must have been suffering, otherwise why would God have blessed her with a second child when her sister remained childless? The Bible continues that, again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. Levi is the third child born to Jacob, and we can see here that as this is the third son, Leah still had some hope that Jacob will become attached to her. It's hard to fault her thinking, and we come to sympathise more with Leah in the same way God does, for in birthing three children, she has already gone above and beyond the efforts made by Rachel. One might argue that she gives Jacob the gift of life three times, and is the only one responsible for making him a father in the first place. So surely on this third occasion, Jacob had to give her something, right? Wrong. In fact, Leah ends up conceiving a fourth time, where the Bible tells us, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. At this point, the birth of Judah is a turning point for Leah, for we see that no longer does she express hope that Jacob will acknowledge her. Instead, she appears tired of his rejection, and instead offers her praise and gratitude up to God. One might say that after the neglect experienced by Jacob, it drove her closer to the Lord, and with this, believers might derive an analogy here that one may find God through times of suffering, or that God allows his subjects to suffer so that it will eventually lead them to him. Without these circumstances, it's unlikely that Leah would have ever found God in the way that she did. Now here we get to see things from Rachel's point of view, and we see her respond to the birth of her sister's children, not with love or welcome, but instead jealousy and resentment. It sees her begin to take her frustrations out on Jacob, and almost accuse him as being the reason why she has not become pregnant. The Bible tells us, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. We get a pretty good sense of Rachel's despair, given that she considers death when facing the possibility of not having a child. It's probably the first time in her life that Rachel experienced such jealousy towards her sister and this perhaps warrants her extreme reaction, for she is unable to process these new and conflicting feelings. It was Leah who had always watched from the sidelines, and in this, she had become almost used to it, and suffered in silence. But Rachel, who is forced to experience it for the first time, cannot control herself, and this, as we see, leads her to threaten her husband with her own death. The conflict within the family was palpable at this point, and Jacob responds to Rachel's anger with anger of his own, furthermore adding fuel to the fire. Despite his outburst, he does recognise the power of the Lord, as he tells her, Am I in the place of God, who has kept you from having children? We understand from this section that Jacob is not empathetic towards Rachel's outburst, and seeks to remind her that if there is a problem with conception, it is probably her, as he has already produced a child with Leah. He also notes that he is not as powerful as God, so it was fruitless to pester him about childbirth when it was God who made all the decisions. 
So Rachel, in her resentment and desperation, makes a biblical throwback to the days of Abraham and Sarah. And having desired a child so badly, she gives Jacob, her servant, Bilhar, for him to impregnate, so that she may have a child of her own. The Bible tells us, Then she said, Here is Bilhar, my servant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me, and I too can build a family through her. Naturally, many would draw parallels to when Sarah had gotten frustrated with not being able to conceive a child. But instead of resigning to God's plan and putting her faith in the Lord that she would get what was promised to her, she took it upon herself to force his hand by giving Abraham her handmaiden Hagar, of whom he conceived the illegitimate Ishmael with. With this surrogate mother arrangement, we see that Rachel has completely surrendered to the fact that she cannot have children. She does not pray to God, nor is she seen to ponder on the thought that maybe she was being punished for her own vanity and her haughtiness towards her sister. Instead, she finds a more pragmatic solution to her problem by introducing Billa, and like Sarah, she seeks to build her family through another woman, and in a sense, establish a loophole in God's plan. Of course, you might simply say that Rachel was unrighteous and never bothered to consult the Lord because she underestimated him, and thus, it's much less of a loophole in his plan and much more of her stooping to any lows to get what she wants, even if this means sullying her marriage. So Jacob does sleep with Billa, as Rachel instructed, and she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. In this statement, we understand that despite the surrogacy, Rachel views this as her child and deems that God has vindicated her by allowing this method of pregnancy to happen. It's interesting that she's not seen to mention God at all until this point, and some might say that she only rejoices his name now because she had gotten what she wanted. She believed he had listened to her plea, and though this might be true, it's uncertain whether he approved of this, but allowed it to take place anyway, as he had done with the pregnancy between Abraham and Hagar. With this outcome, it might be said that the motives behind both sisters' wants for a child are questionable, though Leah's might be deemed as more wholesome. You see, where Leah had wanted a child to earn her husband's love, Rachel had only wanted a child to compete with Leah, and to consolidate her image as the superior sister, both in looks and popularity, and as a wife. To reinforce this belief that she has, the Bible tells us that Rachel's servant, Bilar, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister and I have won. So she named him Naphtali. One child was not enough for Rachel. Evidently, she realized that Leah would always have the advantage given that she had produced more children. So by instructing Jacob to sleep again with her servant, it could be said that she saw this as less about starting a family and more about repairing her bruised ego. Furthermore, she gives way to arrogance and celebrates that after such a great struggle with Leah, she has won, which is probably incorrect on all accounts. The struggle was not great at all in that Rachel doesn't actually do anything except request that Jacob sleeps with her servant. She does not go through the pangs of childbirth, nor does she suffer from the associated discomforts of carrying a child in the first place. The only struggle she appears to have is with her own jealousy towards her sister and her inability to humble herself. Furthermore, to say that she has won was certainly premature, given that she was still short of three children in order to get ahead of Leah. At this part of the story, Rachel has not come across as a wholesome character, and for the most part, many will side with Leah, given that she was the underdog. 
Leah's traits have proven to be far more honourable than Rachel's, who appears only to have children as a means to one-up her sibling. But in the next section, we see Leah's fall from grace, as she begins to play the very same game against Rachel. Now, we know that Leah had stopped having children after her fourth child, and perhaps, on some level, she knew she would not be able to have another child, or perhaps, no longer wished to, having delivered four already. But she appears to have grown concerned that her sister would overtake her in producing children through her surrogate, and so sought to maintain her position as the wife who gave Jacob sons. In some ways, it's understandable. Rachel had likely won every encounter she'd ever had with Leah, given her beauty and popularity. So Leah wishing to cling on to the one victory she's ever had is not hard to reconcile. But the way she goes about it is questionable, as she takes a leaf from her sister's book and stoops to her level by instructing Jacob to sleep with her servant Zilpah. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, what good fortune, so she named him Gad. In this, we see that both wives begin to compete with each other by using other women's bodies as tools, and that the children in which they conceive become much less like sons but instead like points, points used in this morbid contest to determine which sister was better. As if she needed any more of an advantage, Leah's servant bore Jacob yet another son, to which we are told, Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy I am, the women will call me happy, so she named him Asher. At this point, some might say that Leah was adding salt to the wound of her sister and really wanted to drive home the feeling of how she'd probably felt for most of her life. She didn't need to have another child through her surrogate, but chose to do so because she knew it would keep her ahead in the scoreboard between herself and Rachel. With this idea, we really begin to question who exactly we're rooting for in this tug of war between the two sisters. And you might say that this is an example of confrontation within family, where it becomes difficult to decide who is right and who is wrong. You might also say that the Bible is seeking to show us that in every case of animosity between two people, both play a part in how it transpires, and one can either choose to take the high road and rise above it, or sink to engage and lower oneself into conflict. Whilst we've spoken a lot here about Leah and Rachel, it should also be noted that neither wife may have been instructing Jacob to sleep with their respective servants, beyond the first occasion, but that Jacob had gotten a taste for more women and so continued to sleep with them. Another idea frames Jacob as the victim, and that his punishment for his previous transgressions and deception was not quite over in that now after being tricked into marrying both sisters and roped into several years of servitude for Laban, he was now being milked for his semen and forced into performing sex, all so that Rachel and Leah could get an advantage over the other. Neither woman appears to have more children for some years, and we learn that the firstborn Reuben was old enough to find mandrakes out in the fields. Thinking his mother Leah would like them, he brought them to her as a gift, which was greatly received. Whether it was the mere thought of bringing his mother a gift that touched her, or whether the gift itself had a deeper meaning for Leah, is unclear, but some have proposed that mandrakes were once believed to increase fertility, and so, upon receiving the mandrakes, Leah was once again rejuvenated in her desire to outshine her sister. It's also possible that she may have seen the mandrakes as a sign from God, that she was meant to have more children. But it's also probable that she may have applied this meaning herself so as to justify making Rachel feel even worse. 
Note, Rachel has still not conceived her own child. So if Leah was to conceive again, through natural means, it would surely be a kick in the teeth. We are told that Rachel saw the mandrake in Leah's tent and asked her if she could have some, which appears to have been an innocent enough request. But to her shock, Leah responds by telling her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? There's a few things to say about Leah's defensive response here. Having known that mandrakes may have improved a woman's fertility, she is quick to dissuade Rachel from it and responds with such a snappy response that it makes her look petty. You might say that Rachel's request for the mandrakes revealed Leah's insecurity because if Rachel got her hands on the mandrake and was suddenly able to conceive a child of her own, then Leah would have surely lost Jacob forever, for Rachel would use her beauty to seduce Jacob and produce all the sons that she wanted. She continues to challenge Rachel by succumbing to the delusion that Rachel had stolen Jacob from her, which is pretty bold of her given that Jacob had never chosen her. She questions Rachel's morality in this instance, but it is actually a lot more revealing about her own feelings of inadequacy when compared to her sister. Rachel is now seen to handle the situation with a little more modesty than previously demonstrated. She brokers a deal with Leah, telling her, Jacob can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. The deal is accepted by Leah, who proceeds to hand over the mandrakes so that she can sleep with Jacob. Whilst it is not clear, it seems that Leah requires permission from Rachel in order to sleep with Jacob here, or that perhaps the sisters would take it in turns to sleep with Jacob. By relinquishing the mandrakes, Leah gets to spend the night with her husband once again, but of course, at the sacrifice of the mandrakes. It's interesting that upon approaching Jacob to tell him of the arrangement, she does not talk to her husband like he's even a person. She treats him very much like a servant, telling him, you must sleep with me, I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. Once more, we get the idea that Jacob is something of a victim here. He's not even allowed to decide whether he agrees to basically being pimped out by his wives and does not appear to challenge the decision that both sisters have made. Now you might say that this was representative of Jacob's acquiescence, and at this point he didn't mind sleeping with either sister, and so wasn't really affected. But other ideas suggest that Jacob was taken advantage of, in that he had no say in the matter. Notice Leah even tells him that she has hired him, making him seem much less like a husband and a family member, but more like a servant, perhaps just as Laban had. But clearly, God didn't see it this way, as he continues to reward Leah with yet another child, Jacob's fifth son, Isaac. The Bible tells us, in fact, God listened to Leah, and she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So she named him Isaac. Now it may have been a bit supercilious for Leah to assume that God was on her side and that he had condoned her orchestration of Jacob sleeping with her servant. But given that the Bible tells us that God had listened to Leah, I suppose one might be correct in assuming that Leah speaks truly. This is only further substantiated when, yep, you guessed it, Leah conceives again. The Bible tells us, Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has presented me with a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Here we see Leah come to adopt a new perspective and some might argue that she does not wish to have Jacob's love in this moment, but more importantly, his respect. She declares that having produced a total of six sons by herself, the very least he could do was honor her 
and in that capacity, acknowledge her determination and struggle, and hold these virtues in the same regard that he held Rachel because of her beauty. Believe it or not, Leah goes and has one more child with Jacob, a daughter named Dinah. Finally, after her own years as suffering as the number two sister, in terms of raising a family, God finally remembers Rachel, and he enables her to conceive without the use of a surrogate. The Bible tells us, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph. Here we see that Rachel is able to recognize her own behavior and understand it to be disgraceful. By owning her previous transgressions and admitting where she had been impious and bitter, it shows us that Rachel did experience some considerable growth. This might be warranted by the fact that God does enable her to conceive and while she had not admitted it beforehand, God may have known that she had really changed and that having experienced the elements of her sister's life, she no longer took her own blessings for granted, nor held them over her sister's head. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.